Welcome to Football Fridays on the Sidelines. I'm here to uh, talk about and introduce Laura Carlson. Um, first, the Football Fridays lecture series, we started this about three years ago, and it's been growing momentum um, every year, and this year we've got a great lineup, so we're very excited. And today I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Carlson. Laura is the Vice President and Associate Provost and Dean of the Graduate School, as well as a Professor of Psychology. She's from the Boston area, and she did her undergrad at Dartmouth and then finished with her PhD from um, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And she's been at, at Notre Dame since 1994. Her research uh, primarily is interested in spatial cognition, how we mentally represent the places and objects around us, and is the author and co-author over 65 articles and chapters. She's a big supporter of the Alumni Association, especially as a lecturer in our Hesburgh Lecture Program. And we appreciate with all of her commitment to uh, traveling to our clubs along with all her responsibilities here at Notre Dame. So I want to thank Laura for taking her time today and, uh, and, and sharing all of us with her knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Can you all hear me OK? Yes, indicate in the back, yes. Everyone's saying no. Is that better? Great. Thanks. Testing. I can hold it. There we go. OK, if I forget and it goes down here, Mike, go like that. OK, here we go. Well, thanks for coming. Congratulations on finding your way here and not getting lost. I'm going to start by talking about a family ritual. We have a lot of rituals in my family. This one involves the New Yorker magazine. How many of you are readers of The New Yorker? Anyone? OK, some. OK, The New Yorker magazine a couple of years ago started a cartoon contest, which they would publish a cartoon like that. That's just one example. And they would invite the readers to write in captions. And so on the back page, what you see in these issues are three phases of the contest. So the first phase is the cartoon that's under that, that people are writing in captions for. The second phase is a cartoon that had received that had been published a couple issues previously that had received a number of captions, and it was the top three that they really liked, and readers were allowed to vote on the best caption out of those three. And then the third phase is from a cartoon that had been published even previous to that that had the winning caption. Okay? So the ritual in my in my family is that we on New Yorker Day, we would race to the mailbox to grab the issue of New Yorker and read, uh, see, because it, it's just fun trying to figure out what a caption would be and see what the winning captions are and if we agreed with the winning ones. So one day, we raced down to get the latest issue. And no, we didn't win. We've actually never submitted a cartoon. But I'm bringing it up because the winning caption is completely relevant to what we'll talk about today, which is why you get lost in buildings. So I've given you some time to look at this. I don't know if you all have your own ideas about a caption for this, but the winning caption was from Patrick House of Slate. And it says, OK, I'm at the window. To the right, your right, or my right. So what I really like about this um, caption is that I think it correctly conveys that we're always a, just a little bit uncertain about space. Now, my daughter's in the audience, and she would say, well, mom, you're always uncertain about space. But I think that in the, if there is some uncertainty, and there's certainly uncertainty when you get lost, it's because of three primary things. And I think those are captured well in this cartoon as well. The first one is the elements of the environment that you can actually see. So what you perceive, what's available in the environment. And we'll be talking a lot about buildings. But in this case, in this example, the window that frames, the, that frames him is really also constraining what he's able to see and make use of. The second thing is what he's paying attention to. I mean, I look at this cartoon, I just want to kind of shake him and say, well, you just look out the window. Stop this talk. It's right there if you would just turn your head and pay attention. And then the third component of it is the way in which we think about the space around us. And so that's captured in the caption really nicely about this ambiguity about how you might interpret right, my right, your right, 
or to the right as an environmental frame. So those three things, I think, in combination, as I'll talk about for the rest of the talk, are the things that help drive whether you successfully find your way or whether you get lost. Now, those three things in combination here are sort of amusing, but they can have some dire consequences. You may have been familiar, you may remember, this got a lot of news coverage. The station is a nightclub in Rhode Island, um, and there was a fire. It was the fourth deadliest fire uh, in the United States. The fire started at the stage. Uh, one of the, the crew members uh, lit off pyrotechnics in conjunction with the show. That caused fire, which um, ignited the foam along the walls of the show. Do you remember the news, news coverage of this, perhaps? Okay. 20 seconds after the pyrotechnics went off, the band stopped playing and noted that there was something, there was a problem. So initially they just thought it was part of the show. So 20 seconds, less than a minute, the entire stage was engulfed. There were 462 people in attendance, 100 died and 230 were injured. And they were injured, they died and were injured because they couldn't get out of the building. I want to give you a sense of the complexity of the problem that they faced. In a very short amount of time, they had to find the exits and leave. So I'm going to do that in two ways. The first thing is I want to show you a simulation of the fire. I didn't actually produce these simulations. They're available online. I'll explain to you the parts of it that I can. The most important thing about this simulation is that the fire started at the stage, as I said. So I'm hoping this works. So can you see the pointer here? This is the stage area. And when I start this, you'll see how the fire spreads. This counter down here, oh, I'm not supposed to use this when the video is playing because it messes it up. So I won't touch that. I'm going to use my hand. This counter here is time. That temperature scale is in Kelvin. Just to give you a reference point, 288 is about 57 degrees or so. The other end of the scale, I mean, this is unbearably, unimaginably hot. So we're a minute and a half in. Okay, so we're about two and a half minutes in now. I'm gonna use this even if it messes it up because I wanna orient you. The next image you're gonna show, and I'm gonna show you is a simulation of the evacuation of people. And the, the orientation of the building is similar. The stage is gonna be on this side, but it's tilted, so it's even. This one is a little tilted. So to help you line up things, see this structure here? You'll see a similar structure on the next slide, okay? This is the main entrance right here. Oh, this doesn't work on red. Let me get to the next one. Okay, let me, I'll show you the plot in a minute. Let me go over just some of the things to have you look at. There are four exits. Most people, though, try to go to the main entrance because that's where they came in. The people that you'll see are colored. So the color indicates how quickly they responded, how quickly they detected it was an emergency situation. So red are the fastest responders. They're the ones that are clustered on the floor as opposed to the stage and the surrounding. The floor color will change during the simulation. The color indicates how much smoke there was at head height. The darker the color, the worse it is. And you'll see what happens when the floor turns black. There will be body markings on the floor that show where the, there, where the simulation predicts fatalities. And then I'm going to point to you out a counter at the top, and that counter is a running counter of how many get out of the building and how many die. Okay, so just before I start it, hopefully I'm not going to mess this up, this is the stage here. This is that same structure I was showing you. People in red are going to be the ones responding more quickly. This is the main um, entrance here. There's an exit off of here. And there are a couple of, our ex a couple of other exits that you'll see as you see people trying to move. Oh, and one more thing before I start, since I'm gonna lose the pointer. Up at the very top, do you see that out? That's the number of people that gets out. That's a counter and um, a counter for the number of people who die, okay? All right.
So you can see some predictable places where there's some clustering at the exits and then people switching course and trying a different exit. So a lot of people, 129, 135, 40 people getting out, and now the floor is changing, which means the smoke concentration is increasing. So now it's particularly bad in this area, and now you're gonna start seeing the fatalities here. The counter at the top, we're a minute and a half in from the start of the fire. I think these things here, the yellow and green tri uh, rectangles are windows. So we are, by that clock on the top, two minutes in. So public service announcement. Do you know where the exits are in this room? It's where you came in. That's probably a good habit to keep in mind whenever you enter a new building. Make sure you know where the exits are. And you know that, I know you've heard it millions of times, but I think the speed at which this is happening is incredibly frightening. People are making, having to make very snap decisions about where to go. And that has everything to do with their understanding of the environment, what they perceive, those three elements I talked about with respect to the cartoon, what they perceive, where their attention is, and how they're interpreting space. Okay, so we've actually done some work. This is a framework that's come out of my lab that talks about how these three elements in combination can predict whether you find your way or whether, in fact, you get lost. So I'm going to go through each of them in, in series, the building, the cognitive map, and strategies and individual differences. So the building has some blame here. There is a fault of the building in terms of why you might get lost. Lots of people have stories about buildings they hate because they always get lost in them. I'm going to talk about a couple of buildings. There are classes of buildings that are notoriously difficult to navigate. First one I'll talk about are libraries. So is there anyone here from Seattle? OK. Um, this is a, my favorite example of a library um, and wayfinding. This is the Seattle Public Library. It was designed by Rem Coolhouse. I'm going to show you a couple of exterior shots. It's incredibly interesting. I don't know how you can walk down the street and not want to go into this building. Um, here's some interior shots. Oops. Okay, just to give you a sense of the space. Okay, the good about this building. It was named Time Magazine's Outstanding Building in 2004 when it opened. And it won the American Institute Architects Honor, of, um, Honor Award for Architecture in 2005. It's a very prestigious award. The not so good. After it opened, you'd, um, there was an article that came out in terms of the review for the New York Times that said wayfinding is a kink that's not working. Wayfinding is really just your ability to find your way in the building. And an article in the local Seattle paper described the need to install signs to assist navigation. When you go into a building, if you see a lot of proliferation of signs, some hand-drawn or some that just don't seem part of the original design, that's a key indicator to you that that building is hard to navigate. So that's the not so good. The really not so good are comments that users of the library wrote in to blogs. So there's the blog reference, and I just provided two for you. I'm still not sure how I would get out if there was ever a fire, even after visiting weekly for almost two years. And I left the building as soon as I could figure out how to get out, hoping I wouldn't have an anxiety attack first. Somewhat amusing, not so much after we saw the fire example, and not so much if you consider that a, that a library is a public building. It should be open and used for anyone in the public of any spatial ability. We'll talk about different spatial abilities in a minute. Taxpayer money goes to this building, so it's a fabulously wonderful and interesting building, but we also want to make sure that people can use it. Some of the features that are particularly challenging in this building is that it has things like an escalator that goes from the third floor to the fifth floor. As you can see here, this is the fourth floor right here. See these stacks? You can't get off the escalator to go to those books. So if you want to find a book on the fourth floor, you have to go to the fifth, find a staircase, go down to the fourth. Um, you have very short lines of sight. 
that's related to your ability to perceive in the environment. So this is actually, um, in interviews with the architects, he talks about this as sort of moving through the womb and the birth canal. It is red, this is not a distorted color. This whole room looks like this whole corridor is this color. You also have lack of differentiation and that is a very challenging feature um, in the sense that it's hard to track where you are. And a lot about knowing where you are and getting lost or not knowing where you are and getting lost is understanding where you are. In this case, there's a lot of confusion about which stack you might in, which corridor you might be in. There are a number of corridors all across the building and so on. And then there's also no easy way to find the exits. So this is another escalator. This one goes up to the book spiral, which at the very top is the start of where the stacks are. The problem is there's no corresponding down escalator. You actually have to go around and either take an elevator or find a set of stairs that go down. Okay, so libraries like this are very difficult to navigate. Anyone have another idea about different types of buildings that are hard to navigate? Museums? What else? Sorry? Hospitals. Often you'll see different color tapes in hospitals that take you to some of the different wings. What else? I have a very specific one in mind. See if you can read my mind. Classroom buildings, yeah, probably due to a lot of this lack of differentiation. Malls. You haven't got it yet. Keep going. No, all right, I'll, I'll take you out of your misery. Casinos. This is a very virtuous group. Apparently you have not spent any time in casinos. <laughs> However, casinos are an interesting class of buildings because people who visit casinos like to gamble, typically, but they also sometimes like it because they, they allow themselves to get lost. They describe it as sort of being in like a playground kind of environment. And the way they're designed really helps encourage that so if you want to do that, it's the perfect place to go. If you don't like that, though, you're going to get lost in a casino. So let me tell you a little bit about it. There's actually a management group. Hopefully there's, there's no one here in that management group in this audience. But this is just one example of people who help others design casinos. And they have certain uh, things that they look for. So they want to focus the visitor's attention uh, toward the gambling equipment. They want to guide guests into that. One of the ways they do that is they put these drivers, which are like food, beverage, entertainment, strategically located to draw people into locations where there are gambling tables that are maybe hard to find. So I have two plots for you. And the first thing I want of diff just different casinos, just to make the point. First obvious thing to notice, I have trouble with this, is that this is not a rectangular typical shape, right? It sort of comes around like this, Moreover, the entrances are really hard to find. It took me some time to figure out exactly where they were. I think there's one down here. It doesn't help that it's in white link, but, um, and then there's some here. And then over here, I think there's sort of an entrance to a garage. But when you're immersed in this space here, it's not at all obvious where you would go to get out. Same thing in this plot. Oh, this is the one that has. So here's a parking garage where you're going to park. This is way heck off the way. So if you're in here, your intuition might not be that you're going to go here. Because again, this is an irregular space. So it's hard to predict when you're in the middle of that building where you would go. Now we'll talk a little bit if, and later in the talk about this book by Colin Ellard. But if you're interested in this topic after this talk, this is a book I would highly recommend. It's very accessible and it's tremendously interesting. He um, picks on Friedman, actually, and he says, spatial desi Friedman designs spatial uh, layouts for casinos that work explicitly against good wayfinding. And they seem to be oriented to getting people to spend as much time at the gambling machines as possible and make it as difficult for them to leave the building as possible. Which, again, may be a fine thing if that's what you want to do, go, to a, go into the casino as sort of a playground. But you need to be aware that when you're doing that, you're gonna be challenged in finding the exits. All right, there's one more example I wanna talk about. How many of you are IKEA shoppers? Okay, a couple people. How many have never heard of IKEA before? Don't be shy. Okay, you've at least heard of it. Great, okay. IKEA 
is actually very well known in my um, in my field as a case study of um, a very interesting environment that it's easy to get lost in. Actually, you don't get lost in it. You just can't go through it, navigate it effectively. This is just a conceptual image of what someone thinks a Kia looks like. It feels that way when you walk through that store. I want to juxtapose that against these two points. If you talk to the managing director, in this case for the, United, for the UK and Ireland, she says this type of layout is designed to inspire. Talk about that in a sec. Um, and if you look, Dr. Alan Penn at UC uh, London has done a lot of work on this, um, on, on IKEA. He estimates about 60% of the purchases that leave the store are not what the person went in for. So it is designed to inspire. You might wonder what it is designed to inspire you to do. Probably purchase. This is, a, this is the actual plot of IKEA. It has two floors, show, uh, showroom and marketplace. You come in here, and you're actually not allowed to have a cart. I think they've changed this now, but it used to be you didn't actually get your shopping cart up on the second floor. And so this is the path you actually have to take. You can't get lost. There are no turns. You can't go anywhere else but on this path. And what the, the design to inspire point is, as you're going through the showroom, they have these lovely displays. I mean, they really are lovely. I wish I had an unlimited budget, and then I would go in and, and ha buy everything that they have in there. Kitchens, living room setups, study setups, bedrooms, those kinds of things. So you navigate through all the way down until you finally are very close to where you started, and then you get to go down to the marketplace, and you get your cart, and now, again, you have a very constrained path. This is not the kind of building you want to go into if you're looking for one set of napkins. Right? People who shop at IKEA regularly know this. They, like, we were talking in my lab about it. They're like, yeah, if I know I'm going to IKEA, I'm budgeting three hours for me to get through. Now, really efficient IKEA shoppers know where they're short. There are shortcuts here because employees have to go do re restock. You're not going to want them to have to do all that. So there are shortcuts. Um, look for them next time. Typically look behind you. You can find them. But it is a case in which, as you're going the circuitous route, you also can't see much beyond. Right? So it's hard to know where you are within the building, and it's hard for you to build, get a sense of what that structure of the building is. OK, so those are three examples of why the building might be at fault when you get lost. Now, we can't just say, though, it's the building. It's the architect's fault. There are two other components. One is you, as the navigator, what you pay attention to. And when I say what you pay attention to, what I really mean is what you decide from the outside world to represent internally. And we're just going to call that your cognitive map, your representation of this place outside. OK, so we'll just say a cognitive map is an internal representation of the outside world. And the first question, obvious question, would be, OK, what gets into the cognitive map? So I'd like you to watch this clip and think about Really, the, if you say, if you're asking what gets into the cognitive map, you're really saying, what do we remember about the environment? OK, so I'm going to let this play. It's from a friend of mine named Dan Simons at uh, Illinois, who does this research. Perception test. Watch this brief video of a conversation, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Hi, Sabina. Hi. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Andrea. So how did you get here? Uh, I took the subway from Middleton, and it took only about half an hour. Really? I drove from Gresham, and it took 45 minutes. Hmm, hooray for public transportation. So why did you call me here for this mysterious meeting? I'm planning a surprise party for Jerome, and I need your help to keep him away from the house. That's great. I'll do anything you need. Good. I hate surprise parties, but only when I'm the victim. Otherwise, they're great. Very good. Other than the strange dialogue about a surprise party, did you notice anything unusual? In our book, The Invisible Gorilla and Other Ways Our Intuitions Deceive Us, book. we discuss the illusion of memory. We think we perceive and remember more of our world than we actually do. The movie you just watched had nine intentional editing mistakes. Did you spot any of them? Anyone? Watch it again. Notice that the woman on the right, Sabrina, is wearing a scarf. In a moment, we'll have a close-up and the scarf will be gone. 
notice that the scarf is gone, and Andrea, the woman on the left, has her arm on the table. Now it's at her chin. Scarf is back. Notice that the plates are red. Now they're white, and Andrea's arm is back on the table. Now they're red, and Sabrina's arm is off of the table. Notice that the food is in front of Sabrina. Now it's in front of Andrea. The cups and the spoon have also switched places, and Sabrina's arm is on the table when it wasn't before. Most people don't notice any of the changes, a phenomenon known as change blindness. But most people are confident that they would notice the changes. That is the illusion of memory. How many, no did anyone notice any changes? Oh, it's stunning, really. Okay, so... Um, kind of distracted in a way, or I would rephrase that and simply say it's what you're attending to. You're watching the people, their faces, you're trying to understand the dialogue. The important point I want to make, though, is that all that information is available there. You're choosing not to encode it. So if you think about space and the environment now, if you think about having a cognitive map, you're not storing everything that you could possibly store, right? So that's the answer to the question of what is in our cognitive map, only partial information. And I think that that demo really illustrates that powerfully. So if that's the case, then you should worry a little bit about what you do when you need information that's not in there. So what happens when I then ask you questions about information that is missing? So now it's trivia time. I told you there'd be a quiz. Here we go. Tell me, which is further west, Reno or San Diego? How many say Reno? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. How many say San Diego? OK. Which is farther south, Orlando or Tijuana? How many say Orlando? How many say Tijuana? OK. We're getting a mixed, I'm, I'm looking around because I can see everybody. We're getting a mixed uh, set of responses. Which is further east, Santiago or New York City? Santiago, New York City. OK. You want the right answers? Here you go. Reno is west of San Diego. See this up here? Orlando is south of Tijuana. Santiago is east of New York City. That one's really hard. Sorry, I keep breathing into this. The reason this happens is that we reason by categories. So we know that cities are in states. We know that states are in continents. We know the relative location of the continents. We know the locations of the states, mostly. So we take that information and we infer the locations of cities, right? OK, so now what would you say? Which is further north, Seattle or Calgary? How many say Seattle? How many say Calgary? Canada is further north than the United States. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> the point here is that the reason that we use those kind of heuristics or those shortcuts of saying, well, I know where the states are or I know where the continents are or, um, is because usually it works. Right? I showed you three kind of examples where it was violated, where it doesn't make sense. But most of the time, it does work. So when you need to use missing information, you're going to take a guess on what you do represent. And importantly, most of the time, those are good guesses. Okay? But not always. OK. So Part of why you get lost is a fault of your cognitive map. You have impartial information. You can use some information you have to make guesses. Most Sometimes that's right. Sometimes it's wrong. Okay, the last component that contributes to why you might get lost is you yourself and the strategies you might use. Okay, so I love this image. I, I, I use it to advertise for my lab research opportunities to encourage undergraduates to work in the lab. 
because it reminds me a lot of me and my husband. Well, it's not perfect, I know, because I don't have dark hair and my husband does not have a full set of hair. This actually is a more accurate <laughs> rendition of this image. Thanks, shout out to Evan for this. Did you notice the change? Yeah, should I go back? <laughs> now that we've just had change blindness. The reason I really love this uh, image though is that it really represents different strategies for thinking about space. So you see he has a head, his head in the map. He's, that's how he's going to map space and understand space. Whereas I'm sitting there not really looking at the map, I'm pointing using my intuition, which is completely flawed in my family. If I say, go this way, which I'm doing so confidently, everyone knows that means go that way. <laughs> it's definitely true, as my daughter is cracking up about. So part of the issue is gonna be what strategy you use when you think about space. So here's a very concrete example of that. That's me in the middle. I have actually normal hair, not bright yellow hair. Um, and those are my parents. And we were having a lovely evening. And I asked my parents a kind of question that kids always ask their parents because they assume parents know everything. That question is, how do I get to the License Bureau? Which I know I've asked my parents this question. I absolutely know I have. Here's what my dad would say. I'm sorry if you can't read it very well. Go north on Cambridge, then go west on Washington. Here's what my mom would say. Turn left by the florist that did your sister's wedding, and then right by the bank that used to be at the gas station. <laughs> Who do you think I go to now for directions? My mom, every single time. My dad tells me that and then I spend the whole time looking, is this Cambridge, is this Cambridge, is this? This one, the, my mom's is so clear. It's completely unhelpful to the rest of you. Maybe my sister would be able to follow it because you know it was her wedding. But um, other than that, it's incredibly helpful for me because it's landmark based and that's how I think of things. Whereas my dad is, is much more cardinal direction based, so north, south, east, west which actually isn't quite fair to my dad because I grew up outside of Boston, as Lisa said. And in Boston, we very rarely use north, south, east, west. So there's, there's a little um, artistic license here. He would definitely use left and right as well. So you could think about what style you are. So we'll call these two styles a survey perspective or an egocentric perspective with landmarks. If you're a survey perspective person, you t like to take a bird's eye view of your environment. You kind of like you're from above looking down on it. You do not turn a map when you're riding in the car. You have a map in a set orientation and you do not change it when you turn. Same thing, you set up your nav navigation system if you have one in your car, so the north is always fixed. And you like to use terms like north, south, east, west. If you're um, an egocentric perspective person and you like landmarks, you're embedded within the environment. You think about it as if you would move through the environment, which means you turn a map consistent with every time you turn in the car, you turn the map. You set your navigation system up so your current heading is straight ahead. It always looks like you're going in uh, the same direction. And you like to use left and right in landmarks. Okay, so, so those are the three factors. And the big takeaway I want you to leave this talk with is that it's the combination of the factors that really matters. So there's some fault of the building, some fault of the cognitive map, some fault of you, the navigator, and the strategies you use. But what's critically important is how those fit together. And I want to go through just a couple examples of that. So I'm a runner. This is actually... Um, a, a path of a race that my son and I did. It's called the Twisted Turkey for obvious reasons. It's a trail run. So you start, I don't know, you start at one of these places and you navigate through. If you like to navigate by left and right, which I like to do, you very quickly get lost because there's so many turns that you have to keep track of. Where it'd be far easier for me in the middle of the race to get a sense of my distance and so on if I could locate myself relative to something fixed in the environment, like the roads, like the first aid station, like where the sun was and give me my cardinal direction points. 
That's a hotel corridor, could be a hospital corridor. These are great for people who like to navigate left and right. Impossible for people who like to navigate by seeing the sun. There's very little to no access to the outside world here. So you can't recover where north, south, east, or west is easily here, right? Now it turns out, it's also like a hospital corridor. There's a hospital in town that I was doing an interview after this um, framework paper came out. And we were talking about difficulties in navigating on these interior corridors with no access to the outside. And they said, do you know what our builder did? Our builder, when they put in these speakers in the ceiling of the building, oriented them so that the name of the manufacturer down here always pointed north. So if you're walking in this, the St. Joe Med for local people, if you're walking in that new building and you want to know your cardinal directions, where north is and so on, look up in the speakers and the, where the name is that will tell you where north is. Which I thought was really great. I have a number of friends who work there, they'd never heard of it. Okay, so what I thought I would end with is um, actually some suggestions about how to avoid getting lost. And these are straight out of this book by Colin Ellard, You Are Here. And I think they're quite powerful, and I think they pick up on some of the themes um, that I've talked about today. So that's, that's where I want to end. Um, the first one is when you're navigating in a new environment, take time to smell and look, and this is straight from him, take time to smell and look at the roses. The difference between expert wayfinders and the rest of us has much to do with being able to pay attention to details. We've talked about that a little bit. So take the time to do that and try not to walk or drive on autopilot. Do so you know when those driving experiences you've had when you're going on a well, a very, very familiar route and then you kind of lose track of where you are? Try not to do that. This is a strategy that I absolutely use all the time. If this, there's nothing else you take from this talk, take this strategy. So when I'm um, traveling, and I'm in an unfamiliar city, and I'm navigating by myself, and I want to make sure I get back to the hotel, the strategy just simply says, when you get to an intersection, and you're going to make a turn, right after you make the turn, look back. Because then you can see what that intersection will look like on the way back. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna be looking for that intersection from the perspective of the way out. And it could look very, you're looking at buildings from a different side, for instance, and so on. So it looks very different. So you might end up looking a little silly because you'll be walking and you'll be doing this all the time, but that's okay, because then you won't get lost. Um, head for home, I think this is a great suggestion too. Within a new environment, Designate some key area as your home base from which you know if you get to that home base, you can find your way. So this could be a main street. Um, it could be uh, the house where you're visiting. On campus, it would be the main building, for instance. All these new buildings up on campus, you know how to get to them if you get to the main building. I don't know what it is about getting lost, but you tend not to blame yourself, right? You blame your spouse or your partner that's sitting in there. It's like, can't you help? Um, this actually is not great for your relationship. I'm a psychologist, I could say that. But it's also not great for your ability to understand where you are in the environment. It's completely distracting you. So try to keep your cool. Um, don't get lost in time. We're actually not very good about tracking time, just like we're not very good about tracking space. So if you know, if you have a better sense of how long it takes to get somewhere, you track time, look at your watch occasionally, then on your way back, you'll have a sense that as you're nearing the location, if you're on the right track or so on. And if you find that it took you 10 minutes to go and now it's 20 minutes getting back, then you probably got lost. This is a strategy that people talk a lot about. Just as a mnemonic, you can use it in the grocery store too. If you have to go buy, I don't know, bread and bananas, you make up a story about how you might combine those. And it's just stitching things together into a story. So the example of my mom's set of directions about going to the florist um, and then turning by the bank that used to be the gas station, I might try to remember something about, okay, well, they had to pay money at the florist and the florist had to go to the bank to deposit the money. So it helps me remember what that sequence is. Um, 
this is actually quite important. It's not necessarily with respect to a building, but if you're in the wilderness, which a lot of people get lost in woods, um, stop moving. Search parties will start at your last known location. So you really want to stay as close to that as possible. And then the last one is make use of technology if you have it. So this isn't, you know, if you're exploring a new space and you're taking pictures along the way, remember that you can use that because the sequence of pictures that you took in reverse will tell you the path that goes back. Okay, I want to thank my spatial cognition lab, which is in the back, Deanne, Jenna, uh, Chris, and Mark. Um, and we actually have an opportunity for you to help us with our research. So we're doing a study about finding your way on campus. We have some surveys. If you have five minutes to spare at the end of the talk, um, they'll be getting up and we'll just hand you a clipboard. You can just sit here in this nice, cozy, warm room um, and do that if you're willing to help us. First, though, before we do that, I'd like to see if you have any questions for me. Yes? You relate to Costco as a place to get lost in. Mm -hmm. I always seem to spend more money when I go there. <laughs> they probably have similar design features as a casino in a way, right? I mean, there's grocery, I don't. I don't think I've ever been in a Costco, but Meyer grocery store the same way. You know, the milk is in the back, which is incredibly irritating because then you have to go all the way through the store. And you think about all the other things that maybe weren't on your list. I'd say it's very similar. Can you speak to visual memory? Some people can see a place after it's gone, and other people have no, can't describe the place at all and really don't know what it looked like. Is there such a thing as visual memory? There is a thing uh, called visual memory. And in fact, I think we use it um, more than you think, especially when we're navigating a new environment. So very early on, if you're, um, so here's the example I like to use. Let's imagine that you um, went to the hospital and had a medical test. And now you have to go get the results of that test. And instead of going to the hospital, you go to the doctor's office. So new medical building. So you go to the front door. You find out where the office is, right? You look at the number or whatever, and somehow you navigate to the doctor, to the office. What I'm really interested in is how do you find your way back to the front door? Because presumably you weren't consciously thinking, oh, I turn left here and right here, right? You're thinking about what, what's going to happen when I hear about these results. And typically what people do, that's a new environment for you, is you'll look for something that looks familiar. It's called beacon navigation. Right? So you'll walk out of that doctor's office, and you kind of look around like, oh, yeah, I remember going by that thing. Right? And so you head to that thing. And you may not know at that thing whether you turn left or right. It might be you stop to get a drink of water. It might be, I don't know, uh, Susan in the graduate school was telling me an example the other day that was just a totally random landmark. But she remembered seeing it. It was snowflakes in a display. It's like, good Lord, they already have snowflakes in the display. And on her return route back, she remembered the snowflakes. Like, oh, yeah, I have been here, so I'm going to head to the snowflakes. And from there, I'll look to see what the next thing is and so on. That's visual memory at work right there. We're very, very good at recognizing things we've seen before. And that's really what you want to try and capitalize on. That's part of what the strategy of look back helps you to do so that now you have just another refer visual reference point of when you're on your return path that you can recognize that intersection by. Hmm? I have two questions. One sure. is, have you given your talk to the architect students here? And the second question is, the studies that you've done, it would seem to me, should influence uh, the legislators that enact building codes for public hmm. buildings, like the Seattle Library. Hmm. And I'm curious to know if there are standards to meet some of the problems that you've addressed early on in the structure. Right. OK, let me take the first one first. Um, so the Seattle Public Library is a project we started in conjunction with an architect. So Ruth Conroy Dalton, is she has her PhD in computer science, but she's also a licensed architect. And she has studied that building extensively. And an outcome of that study is her taking tools um, from architecture and showing that they can predict in a building where you might have difficulty getting lost. So, the, so when I talked about the features of the building, for instance, the long line of sight, being able to really see a lot more of the environment, that predicts that you'll have a lot easier time wayfinding than um, when it's sort of that curved corridor. There you're gonna you might have a lot of difficulty. 
So that gives us an interesting link between what the tools architects use and our ability to find our way. So we've been trying to work collaboratively with architects in terms of infusing the training of architects to include these tools and having them do some kind of analysis of their building that would predict wayfinding in it before the building is built. Because once the building is built, the only thing you can do is add sites. So the building code that, that, oh no, that piece I don't know. I, I, I don't know what input architects have. They certainly have to follow building codes, right? Um, I don't think that they have these kinds of wayfinding metrics embedded in them. Which is a serious problem. I've been wanting to work with them. I have a couple of um, colleagues there who are very interested in taking this idea of, so, so in training and um, architecture, they often have a project where all the students have to come up with a design of something and there are different class sections. So we've thought about, well, let's take one class section and, and teach them these tools and have them think about wayfinding. And another section is your control, which doesn't get that. And then they go through the same kind of um, interpretation and grading, and we can look at the quality of the building and make sure in terms of the design features and see if that really changes what they draw. So, but we're just in the talking stage of that. But I think that's a really, I think it's a really important point. In my lab, the way we handle it is with virtual buildings. So we, we create virtual environments, and then we can change the building pretty easily, and we can try to understand where there are difficulties and where there aren't. We are, have been working with some um, people in the Campus Crossroads project um, to look at some of those buildings and try to get some of those plans so we can try to predict before those buildings are built. I don't, we're not gonna really be able to change anything, but we can anticipate and understand where some signage might be needed. So that's a project I'm, I think is really important. And it's exciting to me because it's my work at, at, at USAT Notre Dame very locally. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. research on why some people have a good sense of direction and other people have none. Like, if I go someplace once, I can't Careful remember. there. <laughs> but, but if I, if I um, I live in a over, over 55 community, which my wife professionally refers to as the village of the dam. And there's there's not there's not a a 90 degree cross. It's all you know winding. And I have a bunch of friends who are you know, smart, intelligent people. They can go one way. I mean, one guy drives around the whole place to get to my house and his house. And it's like they have no idea of direction. Right. So I think there are two parts to that answer. I think one part is experience. Right, so that we do know that there are geographic differences in the strategies that you prefer to use. So I'm on the East Coast, the roads laid out in Boston are not gonna be such that you really could talk about going north, west for extended periods of time, right? Because things are not laid out like they are in some of the cities in the Midwest where it was much more planful and they're on this grid. So I grew up in a system of using left, right. When I moved to the Midwest, Frankly, that was a transition. I'd call for pizza and they'd say, you know, are you north or west of Hagedorn, which is the road I lived on, and I had to have a compass road rose on my door so I could answer that question, right? Only because I'm not, I'm not um, I didn't have a lot of experience working within that system. Now my son, you know, he grew up here. We were one great example from Cub Scouts, he was seven, we were coming off an exit, and you know, exits are a little bit disorienting because you go around this whole turn. And our directions were you had to turn east. It's about nine in the morning. And my approach to usually do things like this is say, well, let's try and go left. And if it's not there, we'll go right. And he said, well, mom, it's nine in the morning. And I said, well, yeah. And he's like, use the sun. The sun tells you we're east. I'm like, you're right. So it's very, it, it's intuitive to him because he grew up in a very different system. So I think there's partly experience. Where you grew up, I think, makes a big difference. I also think it's how flexible you're willing to be. So my, my current theory is that people who are very good spatially are good because they can match their strategy to their environment. So when you're in an environment that needs you to do left and right because you don't have access to outside, you can use that strategy. When, you, when you're in an environment where you can use north, south, east, west, and that's the best strategy to use, you're good at that. For the rest of us, if we're pretty rigid about the use, I'll do fine when I'm in an environment that supports that strategy. 
and I'll fall apart miserably when I'm in an environment that needs me to use a different strategy. Now, do I believe that you can learn it? Sure, but will it be effortful? And if your community is over 55, you're going against 55 years of using the strategy you prefer, it will be hard, but I don't think it's impossible. <laughs> oh, it turns back on you. How many people in this room feel like they could point to the Malloy Center? Uh, it's a new, it's a new building next to. Okay, let, all right. Well, let's start. Let's start easier. Ready, Lisa Hemming? You might need to be the resident. Uh, like, what the official answer is to this? Because I won't know this. Point to the bookstore. Well, some people are pointing here. Some are not. Okay, but actually, the, I mean, if you think about what you had to do for that, the orientation of this room is different than the, or, I think, different than the orientation of the building. And that's actually where people have a lot of trouble, right? So you can be fine if you're out in the hallway, you can see where the orientation of the building is, but now you're in a room with its own orientation, and now you have to reconcile any transformation that has to happen from the room to the building. So can anyone answer this question about where Malloy Hall is? So people are pointing, well, now I'm getting a mix. I will show you a map. <laughs> That's usually what I do when I'm not sure. Anything else? All right, thanks for your time. <laughs>